This is much harder to do in a chair than it is on the floor. It's like that weird fashion pose. Okay, having one, I don't know why I keep fiddling with this turtleneck. Or perhaps not, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Probably like a top 20 list is a flashback book. So this takes, not a flashback book. So, no time to waste. That was a weird noise. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to the continuing saga of my best of 2023 videos. So not a saga, it's all in good fun. But if you guys have watched the other videos, thank you. And if you haven't, I'll link them down below for you guys so you can. But I have decided to break up my best of 2022 into four different videos. So I have done my favorite debuts that I read in 2022. Some of them came up before 2022. I have done my favorite rereads of the year, and today we're gonna to talk about my favorite new to me authors, and it's all gonna culminate in my best of the year. So there will be some slight crossover from the first three videos into my best of, but part of the idea of doing these three other videos was so that I could shout out so many of the books that I loved this year because there is no universe where I'm coming up with like a top 10, never mind just like a top 20 list, because lucky me, I read a lot of great books this year and I just wanna shout about all of them. So today we're gonna to talk about authors who I have never read before, who have been out in the universe and who have come into my life and I'm so happy about it. And I can't wait to read some back lists from these authors and some new front lists from these authors. And basically that's what we're gonna talk about today. So <laughs> let's just do it. Okay, so the first author I want to talk about, I actually have other books of hers, and then I bought this book, and it's the first book of hers that I have read, and she has so many more books that I can read, and I'm so excited about it, and it's Sharon Bolton. So this is The Pact, and this is one of those books that I kind of accidentally discovered when I was, I don't know, doing some research for something, and I loved it. So I have Daisy and Chains, I have The Craftsman, I have something else by her on my shelves already, but this was the first of her books that I have read. And this book came out, I wanna say it came out this year. This book came out in 2021. And I was drawn to this because this one gives me the Dark Academia friend group, Mysteries in the Past, Mysteries in the Present. It has a bit of Tell Me Everything by Cambria Brockman or In My Dreams I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead. This is, I feel like my sweet spot with books. And I feel like it was a great entryway into Sharon Bolton for me. And this is a standalone. So she does have some books with series elements to it. This is a standalone book. So in this one, it has, it says a golden summer and six talented friends are looking forward to the brightest of futures until a daredevil game goes horribly wrong and a woman and two children are killed. 18 year old Megan takes the blame, leaving the others free to get on with their lives. In return, they each agreed to a favor payable on her release from prison. 20 years later, Megan is free, let the games begin. So this also gives me If We Were Villains vibes by ML Rio, and it was so good. So in this book, they are gearing up to graduate from high school, and yes, it's very, one bad decision changes everything. And we get to see the past timeline when they are younger, and then the present timeline where everybody has moved on, everyone has new lives, and they have tried to leave this past behind them and they just they just can't they just can't leave it behind them and i loved the dark and messed upness of these characters the dynamic between these friends this is definitely a relationship of complication obviously of being indebted to someone and there are questions around why somebody would take the blame for this and I think there is a degree of, you know, no one's actually expecting her to cash in on the favor. And, <laughs> oh, Megan, 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 Megan. It's just so much fun. So I really, really enjoyed this book. And what, like I said, what a great introduction to Sharon Bolton as a writer, introduction to me to Sharon Bolton as a writer. And I think if you love those, like I say, if we were villains in my dreams, these past and present relationships, you get not a college campus necessarily, but they were in school when the book started and there is, there is privilege to this, there is expectation on these students, there is um, a lot of wealth in the present day, everyone has a lot to lose. And when you get characters sort of 
fighting to protect what's important to them and the lengths that people will go to to protect what's important to them and to keep their secrets hidden it just creates such an incredible dynamic and such an incredible book so i highly recommend this and like i say i'm excited to read some more sharon bolton books i think i'm gonna do the craftsman next because i believe that has a serial killer vibe to it which just feels right for me so i think that's the way i'm gonna go but huge fan I can't believe it took me this long to find her. But one of the things that I will say that I do love about finding a writer sort of later in their career is you get to dive into such a magnificent backlist and there's so much more to read that you don't have to wait for the next book to come out. So I need to not waste any time into jumping back into some more Sharon Bolton. So stay tuned for more from her in 2023. Okay, had to do a little adjustment here because things happen when you're filming, so it's totally fine. So the next author I wanna talk about, I actually wanted to talk about both of their books because I read them this year and loved them. And it's Boyfriend Material and Husband Material by Alexis Hall. I just needed to reverse the order so they're the right way around. So Boyfriend Material came out first. And this was one of those books that I felt like I heard about over and over again, but had never picked up, obviously, because I just read it this year. And then Husband Material came out this year. So when I had heard there was a sequel coming out, it kind of like upped my curiosity factor even more. And I read both of these books as a combination of physically reading them and the audiobook audiobook is tremendous. I mean, give me a British narrator any day of the week. And I loved these books, like exceeded expectations. So I felt very much like when I read Every Summer After by Carly Fortune, where I thought I would enjoy the book. I didn't know that I was going to love it so much. And these books are nothing like the Carly Fortune book, but more in the experience of reading them. But these books remind me in some ways a bit of, I feel like a Marion Keyes style of writing where you are simultaneously laughing and crying. There is such great humor and wit to these books, but there is also some weightier subject matter, some heaviness to these books, but it is handled so expertly and the stories are woven so expertly that you're just in it. And it like nothing, nothing feels out of place, nothing feels unnecessary. There is great relatability. There is an extended group of amazing characters and friends and family in these books, which is also something Marion Keys just does so, so well. And I had a great time with them. So Boyfriend Material is a kind of fake dating situation, not a kind of fake dating, it's a fake dating situation. So Luke O'Donnell is tangentially and reluctantly famous. So his parents were rock stars. They split when he was a kid. And he is basically famous for being the son of this rock star duo. And he gets himself into all sorts of trouble. So he often winds up on the front pages of the gossip rags. He likes to drink, he likes to party, he likes to go out and have a great time. And he works for this nonprofit and he needs to kind of clean up his reputation because there is a compromising photo of him that has made its way out. And a mutual friend of his is like, I've got the guy for you, Oliver Blackwood. So it says Oliver is as nice and normal as they come, a barrister and an ethical vegetarian, and he's never inspired a moment of scandal in his life. In other words, perfect boyfriend material. So Oliver has his own reasons for needing a bit of a fake dating situation. And even though the two have met before and it did not go well, they decide to give it a go in this book. And I loved the two of them together. So it's a very opposite to tract and the dryness of Oliver's humor with sort of the wildness of Luke is so wonderful together. And the extended friend group in this were absolutely hysterical to me. And I just wanted so much more of them and just wanted to be more in their world. And we get a ton more of that friend group in husband material. So I know that there have been some mixed feedback on husband material and without going into any kind of spoilers, I mean, I feel like it's kind of obvious what's gonna happen in a book like this. And then you know there's a sequel to it. But what I found in husband material, and I understand what didn't work for some people and what some people didn't enjoy about this book. But to me, it felt like the like this is like the fantasy, the honeymoon period, everything is great. And then this is like reality sets in. And this book is told in a four weddings and a funeral style. And it's, you know, your friends, you're getting older and people are starting to pair off and get married and have kids. And the dynamic in the friend group changes, but there's still great wit and humor and love and everything in this book. So I absolutely loved this and I'm just a huge fan. So I will be very curious to see. I know there is a third book coming and I will be buying it and reading it when that happens. The next book I have is a YA book and this is None Shall Sleep by Ellie Marnie. 
So this book is one that I had heard about kind of compared to the Natural series by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. And you guys know I love me a Jennifer Lynn Barnes. Inheritance Game series is great. I do have the Natural series. I started it, I need to finish it. This one also has a comparison to Silence of the Lambs, which is definitely spot on. And I was very, I feel like taken by surprise by how much I loved this book and also taken by surprise with how really dark and messed up this book is. And I feel like I need to rejigger my expectations sometimes for YA books because the YA books that exist today are not the ones that existed when I was a kid. Sweet Valley High, even though I read a lot of Lois Duncan. But there's definitely some books that carry much darker, more shockingly bloody <laughs> subject matter that I wasn't expecting. So this came out in 2020. The sequel is actually coming out in 2023, which is actually kind of exciting. So this book definitely is a one and done. It, it answers questions. There's resolution to this book, but it's also one of those books where I feel like I would love to continue to see what happens with these characters. So I'm excited that there's more to come. So this book takes place in 1982, which is another thing that I loved about it. And it obviously added much more kind of complications to how to solve crimes when you're in 1982. So I loved it. So we are at Quantico and we have two teenagers. So we have Emma Lewis. She is a serial killer survivor. And then we have a U.S. Marshal candidate, Travis Bell. And they are recruited by the FBI to interview juvenile criminals because the FBI and the profilers are trying to get insight into these juvenile criminals to understand their crimes and their motivations, but these criminals have no interest in talking to our stuffed shirt adult FBI agents. So the theory is that if we have teenagers interview them, they will be more open and we will be able to find out more information. So makes sense on paper. But of course there is a current case that is happening and their best way to get insight is to talk to Quote, the country's most notorious incarcerated murderers, a teenage sociopath named Simon Gutmanson. So even though they know it's not a great idea, they wind up sending in our teenager, Emma, to interview Simon. And it is very kind of a Clarice, Dr. Lecter situation that goes on here. And I think it's so well done. And again, I was shocked by the darkness of this book, but I was also here for it. <laughs> I just didn't expect it. And I just thought it was really well done. I, I just had no idea. I had heard like a few little like murmurs about this book, but not a lot. And I think I just wasn't, again, it came out in 2020. I think I just wasn't paying attention, but I really enjoyed this book and was very, very surprised by kind of where the journey took us in this book in the best way. So big fan. I will definitely be picking up the sequel and I will be very curious to read some more from Ellie Marnie. So she has written nine YA crime fiction titles and this is the first of hers that I have read. Uh, won't be the last. Another book in the not murdery category is Part of Your World by Abby Jimenez. This was another one of those books I would say like every summer after that completely took me by surprise. And I had heard such great raves about this. So my friends, Amanda from The Curly Reader and Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand had read this book and totally enjoyed it and were raving about it. And I started to get the FOMO and I was like, well, I have it too and I'm gonna read it too and I wanna read it too. <laughs> and I totally read it and loved it. So this book reminds me of more of like Emily Henry, Christina Lauren, where we get great humor, we get great romance, we get great characters, we get lots of complicated stories, we get friend groups, we get family. So it's not just like, I feel like, and then again, this is like my own stuff that I need to get past. When I hear romance, I have such a stereotypical image in my head of what that means. And romance straight up doesn't interest me. It's just not my go-to, it's not what I gravitate to. And I enjoy romantic relationships in books, but I want other things going on in it. And it's funny, like I don't need romance in my thrillers. It's kind of a once in a blue moon thing for me. So it's like a very finite kind of romance that I like, and this happens to be it. So when this book opens, our main character Alexis is driving back from a funeral and she winds up kind of getting stuck in a ditch and getting a flat tire. And she is in this random little town. She's like an hour or so away from home. And no sooner is she stuck there and she's on the phone with her best friend that a car pulls up behind her and this deliciously good looking man named Daniel comes out and he winds up kind of 
rescuing her from her flat tire. So there is complete chemistry between the two of them. And even though they are literally from different worlds, like different towns, they can't kind of deny what is going on between them. So they each have their own stuff, they each have their own jobs and their own lives and their own worlds. And Alexis is sort of in the throes of some really complicated family stuff. She is an ER doctor, she is a legacy doctor in her family, and there are a lot of pressures on her to carry on in a certain way and to carry on the legacy of her family. And then we have Daniel who is living in this small town. He is like the mayor of the small town basically. And he helps keep everything together there. And the two of them come together. And for Alexis, he's like a great escape from her world. And she likes to be a part of his world. And there's just so much great chemistry. There's some great humor to this. There is a scene in this book that I was crying from laughing so hard. There is just so much fun fun and funniness and like just great um like banter and like the fun part of like when you first meet someone and you have that chemistry and you're having a great time and like you can feel the love and the warmth and you get a great extended group of characters you get some great friend groups going on in here and I love the way that they come together and you see how you know, you have walls up and how you start to let the walls down. And there is some weightiness to this. There are some heavier topics to this book. And it is not all fun and games. I cried when I was reading this book. And I was surprised at how emotionally moved I was by it. But again, I was also laughing out loud at certain moments. So I really enjoyed it. And again, it really took me by surprise. I did not expect it. And I would say like I was surprised at how much I liked it because I feel like I underestimated what this book was going to be about. And I loved the dynamic. So Alexis is older than Daniel. She's dealing with that fact and trying to kind of come to terms with it. And she's trying to come to terms with the fact that like she's just having a fling, but is it more than a fling? And she's so concerned because she's afraid to bring Daniel into her world, but she is always so happy to be in his. And I think it's just such a great dynamic between them. And there were like a few moments that I was like, you know, Alexis is sort of pitched as like privileged and she's always had people to do things for her and she doesn't know how to do things. But like there was this one part where it was like, she doesn't know how to sweep. And I was like, come on, she knows how to sweep. But seeing her in his world and sort of how they, they better each other and how they teach each other things and how they learn from each other, I just really enjoyed it. And again, the, the humor and the wit and the banter that is in this is so great. And then again, it's balanced out also with some of these weightier moments, which I really enjoy. And I think Abby Jimenez just did such a beautiful job weaving the two together and as I say like if you know you know but there is a scene <laughs> I think anyone would laugh out loud about it's just so great like the comic genius of it and the comic telling of it is just so great there's just so many relatable moments in this too I feel like there's just such an authenticity to these characters and to some of these situations that I thought was just absolutely brilliant so I'm very excited to check out more of her books and I definitely am undoing my my stereotypical hang-ups about what it means to read a romance or what what makes a romance because I just think this book was so great Okay, I have another YA book, which also, I guess this shouldn't have taken me by surprise by how bloody it was. It's called How to Survive Your Murder by Danielle Valentine. It's kind of baked into the title that there might be blood in this one. So this one was very much pitched as like, if you love Scream and horror movies, it's super meta. This is definitely for you. I love Scream. I love horror movies. This book is super meta. This book was totally for me. So this is kind of a Groundhog Day but not kind of a book. So in this one, it says rule number one, never go into the corn maze alone. Rule number two, nothing good happens on Halloween. No, rule number three, never be distracted by a hot bad boy. And rule number four, don't die this time. So when this book opens, it's Halloween night and Alice's sister, Claire, brings her and her friends to this party to end all parties. So like the popular girl, Chloe, is having a party and you have to go through a corn maze and then you wind up on the other side and you're in the great big party and everything is fabulous. Except Claire winds up getting murdered that night in the corn maze and Alice is the only witness to it. 
So we fast forward to a year later, it is the trial, and there is kind of this question of, did Alice finger the wrong guy? So we get our scream wink there. And not only do we get our scream wink in that, but Alice winds up meeting a girl who has a striking, striking, striking resemblance to Sydney Prescott, AKA Nev Campbell from Scream. And this is the girl who's telling her, I don't think you saw what you think you saw and you need to fix that. So Alice basically faints in the bathroom of the courthouse and wakes up on Halloween night the year before and she needs to stop her sister from getting murdered and figure out what actually happened that night. Because there is a guy on trial that Alice has accused of killing her sister and she might have fingered the wrong guy. So we don't go Groundhog Day in the sense that we keep reliving the same day over and over. We just go back in time and she relives that one night over. And it's so fascinating to me, like how smart and how all of these horror movies are woven into this. There's huge Scream references in this book. So I really feel like if you are a Scream fan, you will have like just a whole different appreciation for this. But this is definitely bloody. This definitely doesn't shy away from the violence. This definitely doesn't shy away from much of anything. And I was surprised and shocked and trying to figure stuff out and I feel like it was like that same feeling when I was watching Scream, like there's great humor to this, but there's also like, ah, like bloody scenes to this. And you get like a little whiplash from like your head turning in different directions about what's happening. I loved it. I read this book very quickly. I tabbed it up in all sorts of different ways. And I'm so glad I read it. This is another book that just completely surprised me. And I feel like that's kind of one of the best parts about discovering a new writer is not that my expectations were low per se. I feel like I just didn't have expectations other than hearing great reviews, particularly from Gare, from Gare Indeed Reads. He was like screaming about this one, no pun intended. And I was really curious about it. And I just loved it. I loved it so much. So I'll be very curious to read some more from her as well. And it just was fun. It was just so flippin' fun. Great. And yes, it's perfect for Halloween time of year, but also like anytime, you won't be disappointed. So the next book is The Ice Beneath Her by Camilla Greb. And this was the third book I read in 2022. And no joke, I am like still thinking about this book. It was just so good, so good. And this series actually continues, which I have not continued in yet, but I am definitely interested in doing it. So this book is definitely a bit more on the gruesome Nordic Noir side, I would say. But if you are cool with that, this is definitely worth the read. So in this one, we get multiple POVs, we get multiple timelines. And this one opens, I just like always have to read it from the inside flap because I feel like I don't do it any justice. So it says, winter's chill has descended on Stockholm as police arrive at the scene of a shocking murder. An unidentified woman lies beheaded in a posh suburban home, a brutal crime made all the more disturbing by its uncanny resemblance to an unsolved killing 10 years earlier. But this time there's a suspect, the charismatic and controversial chain store CEO, Jesper Orr, who owns the home but is nowhere to be found. So in this one, we wind up following the homicide detectives in the present day who are investigating this beheaded woman. Yep. And then we also get references to the case from 10 years ago that they were also both involved on that was never solved. And in the past case, they worked with a criminal profiler named Hanny, and she winds up coming back to help them with this current case. And it says, but they're not the only ones searching for Jesper. So we get another point of view from a woman who had worked at Jesper's company and it's just so well done. It, there's like such darkness to this book, but there's also such great warmth to this book, which I realize feels like kind of maybe like a funny thing to say, but there are such great relationships between the characters. I love seeing the relationship of them in the past and then she, seeing how it's changed in the present day as they have all moved on to different cases and different points in their life. And there is definitely some weightiness to this in certain things that happen. And I mean, it's, it's spoilery to talk about, obviously, but there's some unique things that are done in this book with our characters that I really enjoyed. And of course there was like, I was asking lots of questions and I was trying to figure stuff out and I was surprised at certain things that happened and I like never would have figured out other things that happened. And I just found myself so invested in these characters and I just loved it so much. And it's definitely a slow burn of a book. 
like I say, very character heavy, kind of in like a little bit of a Ragnar Jonasson or in a ton of French kind of a way where we get great character exploration, but we also get the police procedural on top of it or alongside it. And I really like how it's done. I love how it was woven together. I like how the timelines were woven together and the stories and kind of that slow breadcrumb information about the characters and their dynamics and how they all connect with each other and how, you know, the relationships developed in the past and the present. And I just thought it was great. I really, really, as I say, was surprised with how much I enjoyed it. And it's definitely something that it's, you know, there's like revenge and there's obsession with this past case and trying to solve the case they couldn't solve back then and how that has stuck with our characters and how the cases have impacted them. So also like in a Patricia Cornwell way, how these investigations impact our investigators. But I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed her writing. And for me, she's definitely somebody I need to be checking out more from. And I need to make that a priority because I really, really enjoyed this book. And if you are a seasonal reader, like definitely wintry atmospheric as well. So I feel like this shows up in my winter recommendation video too. <laughs> Trying not to repeat myself, but I feel like I'm nothing if not repetitive. And then the last book I have from a new to me author who I am so excited because not only do I have one of her backlist books already, I also have the arc for her new book that is coming out. And it's One of Us is Dead by Geneva Rose. This was delicious. I had such a fun time with this book. And this is one of those books where I feel like there's a handful of books I have where they're just like physically heavy. I don't know if it's the book cover or the, the paper it's on. It's on like a very thick paper. I feel like this sounds like a very dumb way for me to start this last book that I want to talk about, but the book itself is, is heavy. <laughs> so anyway, physically heavy. But the reading of it is just soapy, rich people behaving badly, drinking, making bad choices, this uber competitive group of friends and I loved it. So it was like a little bit Desperate Housewifey. It was a little bit Hunting Wives by May Cobb and I just had such a fun time with it. But we also get like a little bit of the haves and the have nots in some ways. So in this one we are following a group of women in Buckhead and it says opulence, sex, betrayal. Sometimes friendship can be deadly. So Jenny is the owner of this spa named Glow, which is like the go-to place in Buckhead. And kind of like any great hairstylist, colorist, spa owner, she has this elite group of people who come in to get everything done, waxed, washed, all the fun things, and they spill all their secrets to Jenny, to one another when they are there at the spa. So Jenny knows all the things. And our three main women are Shannon, Crystal, and Olivia. So Shannon is the former queen bee. She used to be married to this politician Bryce, but he dumped her for a younger woman who is Crystal. And it says she stepped into Shannon's old shoes, a young innocent Texan girl. She has no idea what she's up against. And Olivia is the one who has waited years to take Shannon's crown and become the unofficial queen of Buckhead. So this is one of those books where we know on page one that somebody is dead. So our main character Jenny is at the police station being interviewed by detectives. And then we go back three weeks in time and we get that sort of interspersed past and present timeline. So we're trying to figure out who's dead, who did it, all the things. And this is one of those books where like, <laughs> anybody could be dead, anybody could be a killer. And I would basically be happy with any one of them like dying and being the murderer. I would be fine with all of it. And I just really enjoyed it. So there's such like that delicious, toxic female friendship, like just the dark and messed up things that women can do to each other and how envy and greed and revenge and jealousy, like how all of those things drive people to do some really, really horrible things. And I'm always here to read about it. So the kind of have have nots that I had mentioned, like Jenny has this extremely successful spa, like she is the go to place in town, but there's still an element where these women look down on her because they think they are so rich and they are above it and they've got everything. But Jenny is that one who knows all the things. She knows all the secrets. Like she, she knows, she knows, she knows, she knows. And I just think it's absolutely great. So I have Perfect Marriage, which I am planning to read on the Sooner side, which is her previous book. And then I have her arc, which the name of it is escaping me at the minute. I'll pop it up here so you guys can see. So I'm excited to read more from her, but I definitely enjoy her writing style, I enjoy her characters, 
And if you guys don't follow Geneva Rose on Instagram, you absolutely must. Her and her husband do some of the best reels that I've ever seen. She is hysterical. I wanna say she used to be a social media manager and that's why I feel like she really has a great pulse on it, but she creates such great content online and her husband is seriously probably one of the funniest people I've ever seen and I just love their dynamic together. And this is one of those cases where sometimes you get a glimpse into like a, an author's personal life and it just makes me love that author even more and root for them even harder. So I'm excited to read more of her books. I have heard tremendous things about Perfect Marriage. So I'm definitely excited to get into that on the early side in 2023. And when I do, of course, I will tell you guys all about it. So that's going to do it for authors that I discovered this year that I am definitely going to be reading more of and I'm very, very excited to have found. But let me know, did you guys discover anyone new this year? Have you read any of these authors? Have you read any other books by any of these authors that you would recommend? Sharon Bolton. I know she's like burning a hole in my bookshelf. So like I said in the first video, I do wait until December 31st to make my final list of best of books of the year. So I will be filming that probably New Year's Day <laughs> and it'll be coming your way. So until then, or unless there's another video in between, which there very much might be, take care, you guys. I hope everyone's doing great, and I hope you had a great holiday, and if we are across the path to New Year's, I hope you had a great New Year's, and if we haven't gotten to New Year's yet, Happy New Year, you guys, and I will talk to you guys really soon in another video. Appreciate your patience with the crazy. That is me, and I appreciate you guys being here, and I'll talk to you guys really soon. Take care, everybody. Bye. <laughs>